I'm David Hill, your host for this week's edition of Caldwell County Today. We're coming to you from a special place, Wilson's Creek area, one of the loveliest places in Caldwell County. You probably have heard in recent months that the Caldwell County Commissioners and Congressman Cass Ballinger are trying to get Wilson's Creek designated as a wild and scenic river. Congressman Ballinger introduced the legislation, House Bill 1749, in May of this year. And it's in the House Resources Committee now. During a July 8th trip to Wilson's Creek, he had this to say. You got one of the most beautiful parts of North Carolina sitting right down here. And you got a bunch of people that, as far as I know, everybody is in favor of somehow protecting this river. And so I've already introduced the bill in Washington to make this a wild and scenic river. But um, I have never seen a more beautiful place in North Carolina. I think it's a responsibility of all of us to protect this stuff. How different But it protects it from development. It protects, I mean, the, the fishermen and so forth, the beauty of it, the hikers, the campers. But you uh, that's not, it really hadn't been very often in, in, in my term as, as, uh, as your congressman that I've been able to do something that, that's this much fun where you know you're doing the right thing and you don't have somebody cussing you out for it. And, you know, <laughs> maybe I'll get home tonight and the phone will come off the wall, but it, it really appears to me that... Uh, this is something that we can do that's good for the future, it's good for our kids, it's good for everybody, and uh, I'm just fortunate that I'm in a position to be involved and to help you all out. And I just if you haven't been to Wilson's Creek, you might not know why so many people are so excited about the prospect of gaining wild and scenic designation. For starters, there is only one Wilson Creek. The 23.3 mile stream begins on the slopes of Callaway Peak in Avery County. Then it flows through Caldwell County before joining Johns River near Collettsville. It's one of the last sources of clean water, one of the few streams that has not been polluted through the years. What is there about Wilson's Creek that makes it so exciting for so many people who want to go swimming, fishing, or kayaking along the stream? What makes people keep coming back? And what makes a mere handful of people continue to live there year round? We hope to answer some of these questions today. For some people, it's the promise of catching a big trout that lurks under a rock somewhere in the creek. For many others, it's the promise of a swim in the always cool water of Wilson's Creek. Still others enjoy steering a kayak through the rocks and the rapids that appear frequently at Wilson's Creek as it makes its 4,000 foot drop in elevation between its headwaters and Johns River. That is the greatest drop of any stream of its length in the Blue Ridge. Let's let Commissioner Ron Bean tell us about the procedure that's been taking place and why the county commissioners think it's so important that Wilson's Creek be designated wild and scenic. Back in 1987, when there was an inquiry made about the uh, possibility of designating Wilson's Creek as a wild and scenic river, uh, there was a, an effort began to, dis to determine the suitability and eligibility of making it uh, wild and scenic. However, this process kind of laid dormant until 1997, when the Caldwell County Commissioners uh, decided uh, because of the encouragement of our Chamber of Commerce and our EDC and others, uh, we decided to uh, become more active in this process and, and try to uh, uh, make this a wild and scenic river. One of the things that I said early on in this process was, if this thing is going to work, we have to have public participation, and secondly, we have to have partnership. In and, and, and so we started with a ground level approach by getting the people involved first, and then we uh, uh, moved it from the people to getting it uh, publicity to our, our community and, and, and the surrounding county places. Uh, I'm happy to say that uh, from that we had in January, we had a public hearing or a public information meeting in Collinsville. We also met with the Avery County people since this uh, stream starts in Avery County. Uh, we got a, uh, they held a public hearing and then they wrote a resolution supporting our efforts. And so 
We started uh, with the people first who live along the river, then we went to Avery County, and then we took it on to uh, Congressman. To our Congressman Ballinger, who introduced the bill on May the 11th, uh, House Bill 1749 on May the 11th, 1999. The other thing I said about this thing is that we had to have partnership in it. So we've had partnership in from the very beginning with the Forest Service, with elected official, with community groups, with civic groups, and also uh, with uh, many other people who are interested in this process. So we think it's a great project, and uh, uh, hopefully we're real close to getting this thing designated for uh, and get it passed by Congress uh, hopefully this fall or early next spring. John Ramey, a supervisor with the U.S. Forest Service, had this to say about the county's effort. Yeah, we work with 18 county governments that have national forest land in their counties, and I wish all of them was the easiest Caldwell uh, County to work with and could yeah. take a few lessons from In Avery County. County. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Mitchell County. And Mitchell County, too, yeah. yeah. But anyway, this is, uh, you know, we kind of started the process of looking at the river a long time ago, and it was kind of on hold, and uh, the interest came up, and they said, well, we think we can do it faster, and we'll just go this route rather than wait on you guys. So we had a lot of data ready to go, and that, of course, that's their option if they wanted to go the way they go or went so now it's happening so we'll see and uh, if uh, the legislation does happen well then we will get together with uh, all the counties and uh, all of our other cooperators and start working on a uh, corridor plan for a well in St. River. Job service employee Kathy Ludlow had these praises to say. At a uh, National Rivers Conference and um, there were river managers from all over the United States in all kind of agencies and communities. And this process was brought to their attention. And it was seen as just a, a landmark way of doing it. And so you all need to be very, very proud of yourselves. It's, uh, it's tremendous. We're you might mention proud to be part of it. <laughs> if this does happen, it would be the third Wild and Sink River on national forest land in North Carolina right now. If you're already convinced that Wilson's Creek is worth the effort, Maybe before the end of the program, you'll be convinced. We've now moved to another section along the river. This is a section of, of the main road that comes through the community. And you can see this is a section that the Department of Transportation has done some work on just in the last couple of years. You can see where they've drilled through all of this rock, and all this rock is, has been moved over here to form a very nice barrier between the road and, and the, the creek down below, as you can see, obviously these are not creek rocks. These came from over there to here, not from there up here. And with a small number of year-round residents, its narrow, unpaved road and the steep gorge that borders part of the stream, the Wilson's Creek area may appear to be isolated, wild, and primitive. And it is, in some areas with only a handful of year-round residents. In fact, the former town of Mortimer now has only five permanent residents. The village of Edgemont, which originally developed more as a tourist attraction, now has nine permanent residents. Where men once worked, children played, and trains passed, trees now grow. It's difficult now to spot some of the signs of a civilization that was here almost a century ago. Much of the property bordering the creek is undeveloped public land held by the U.S. Forest Service. It's hard to imagine now where I'm standing that up until about 70 years ago, this was a very thriving little community. Right behind me would have been the depot in the town of Mortimer, but now you can see that it's barely anything left up here now. But once upon a time, the Wilson's Creek area with the town of Mortimer and the village of Edgemont actually were the place where things were really happening. History, it's actually hard to believe what was along the banks of, the, of Wilson's Creek and up the hollows around here. We're in the home of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Rob Killian, and we're with Rob Killian, who's 84 years old and was born in the Mortimer area. I think, uh, Mr. Killian, what, uh, your, your family moved here about when? It must be 1910 or 12. And where, where do they come from? Uh, Motel County. And Ritter Lum Company this year. So your dad came here to work yeah, for Ritter? Yeah. 
What did he do with them? Uh, I'm just me, I don't know. Just a lot of hard work? It's hard work. So you've lived here all your life. Remember anything yeah, about that? Cotton mill, yeah. Did you work there? No, I had a brother, two sisters worked in the cotton mill. What kind of work did they do there? Uh, my sisters, I think they run, worked in the spin room. My brother, he worked in the card room, I believe it was. Yeah, man. Well, what kind of work have you done? You've lived up here all your life? What? Yeah, you I worked, I worked in furniture work. I used to work at Barnhart Furniture, and then I moved over to what's called the old Ken Coffin plant, and I worked there 40 years at the Ken Coffin plant. Uh, I worked one house in Parsonville. There's, there's one time up here, I, wor I worked six years and never missed a day. Down at the furniture had, plant? Yeah, we had to go back across Star Hill at that time, you know. We saw that up here, the train was about the only way to get around, wasn't it? Oh yeah, oh yeah. When he was growing up, up here, the train run up in here. Uh, my daddy used to buy all of his stuff down to the old, old city of Flying Feet, you know, and he'd just ride an order down there and they'd ship it up on the train, you know. And we'd get it over yonder, they'd pay it off, you know, the train's awful good. They'd stop in front of your house? Yeah, they'd stop and unload, he'd use to buy much feed and groceries. He, he'd just call it his grocery order, you know, and they'd uh, just send it up, you know, on the train. How often would he call that order in? Oh, about once a month. About once a month? Yeah, man. Send a check in for it. And, yeah. Did you ride the train? Oh yeah, I rode this train out of here many times. Oh, yeah. It used to cost uh, twenty six cents or no that was part of no twenty six cents. So you could ride from, from your house to Lenore for twenty six cents? Twenty six cents, yeah. And, and did they charge you to come back? Oh yeah. It was the same to come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A lot of time us old boys, we we go down on that train. We spend all of our money. It's just I, I walk from town at you know, different time. Just walk up. Here. So boys get together two or two or We just spend all of our money. You know, money was scarce back then. But man had two or three dollars when he went to town. He had a whole lot of money. You know. Yeah, and you didn't go, have any when you came back. We, we go down. and We go to the show. And eat hamburgers and hot dogs. Spend all our money. We. We couldn't catch a ride back, we just walked by. So how long would it take you to walk from oh, to Lenore here? That'd take a long time, didn't it? Yeah, about six or eight hours. There were lots of people who lived up in here, and lots of people who worked up in here. And over the years... Yeah, back when I, when I there used to be a lot of people lived all back on Joe White Mountain, and all down in, there's a lot of people lived up here way back in the old, old times, yeah. And you had doctors up in here? and. Have a doctor. If you got sick, you just died and have a doctor. Well, they have a doctor in Lenore. Lord, I was a grown man before I know there was a doctor. So, what do people do when they got well, sick? They got sick, they just died. Uh, people they didn't. Uh, I, I was a grown man before I know there was a doctor. All right, so people didn't get, didn't get sick like they do now. If they got sick, they just died, you know. Anybody died while well, we uh, we just dig the graves, you know, and we, and uh, most of the time there's lumber yards around. There used to be a lumber yard down here in Hutburr, and uh, we just they just get lumber down there and build castles, you know, and put them in burr, and, and they didn't take no didn't go no film home back in days. I don't I didn't know what a film home was. We just uh, half a dozen of us maybe get together, we just go dig the grave, you know, maybe two or three men make the box and put them in, mix the castles. Always, it's always quite a way good, but uh, it used to be really cost nothing to die, you know. <laughs> but now, you know, if, if you die now, it costs you six or eight thousand dollars to be buried, you know. But like them days didn't cost anything. <laughs> I was about real nice. I was around, I guess I was around 20 when my dad died. How old was he when he died? 55. And when, had he been sick, or do you? No, he, he got killed. He was logging up down on above Mortimer, and uh, we drug out some logs on the bank of the road there on Friday. And he, when they went back on Monday morning, somehow or another, he started to pull up with them logs, and them logs that broke loose and knocked him back in the road and killed him. Were you up there when it happened? 
and not right at the time, we was, uh, me and the other fellows were hauling down and we'd, we'd loaded some above there and uh, we'd haul down to the old, old mill. We had a sawmill up there at that time. And when we got back up there, I was there uh, just a few minutes after it happened. Little is known about the earliest settlers of the valley that follows Wilson's Creek through the mountains. Some people say members of the Perkins family first settled the area. An early grave marker is that of Caleb Estes, who died December 13, 1844, long before a Ritter Lumber Company had been heard of and long before there was a Mortimer or an Edgemont, and only three years after Caldwell County was established. He's buried in what is now the Mortimer Cemetery. Prior to the arrival of the lumber company, the area was known as Hauk. Much of the property that Ritter Lumber developed into the town of Mortimer was acquired from Joseph T. Hayes, D.C. Hayes, John Hayes, and Mary Hayes in 1904. Mortimer was a growing community and needed a good source of water. So now we're at the top of the hill above what was the town at this reservoir that provided water to those citizens down there. But Mortimer started developing before the turn of the 20th century as a lumber town. Ritter Lumber Company, an industrial giant of its day, moved into the area from what is now Pineola and began cutting timber. They cut the timber from the mountains, the slopes, and the valleys, and they moved on to other places where there was more timber. But that's the way things were done in those days. The timber was here for the taking, and there were plenty of people who needed the wages the company paid. They came from many places to labor along Wilson Creek. The people of Mortimer were proud of their village, and justifiably so. It had almost all of the conveniences of modern life in the first decade of this century. In addition, Team Skidder belonging to the Wilson Creek Lumber Company arrived here a few days ago and is now in operation. Mortimer notes, August 15, 1905. Business is progressing nicely and the new band and planing mills are doing very good work. Mortimer notes, September 25, 1905. The use of the paintbrush has made a beautiful change on some of the dwellings here for the past week. Mortimer notes, June 6th, 19th. In addition to the buildings for its lumber operations, Ritter built a company store, a blacksmith shop, a church, a school, a hotel, and numerous houses. The dwellings housed company management personnel, and they were equipped with plumbing and electricity, and were connected by a boardwalk. The electric lights and waterworks together with other advantages make our village a very suitable place for a lumber plant. Mortimer notes, January 1st, 1906. McCord News in a column from Mortimer recorded in October 1905 that Mr. Hutton from Hickory was here last week looking over the line for the waterworks for our village. And just a month later, the writer told readers, the Piedmont Electric Company of Asheville has the contract for putting the electric light plant in operation for our village. The work has begun and is expected to be completed at an early date. The following week, Mortimer Notes recorded, the tank that holds the water to supply our village is now complete and holds 50,000 gallons. Mortimer residents apparently got their water from this large concrete reservoir atop this hill overlooking the town. Most people today think water was pumped from Wilson Creek to the reservoir from where gravity forced it through the water lines down into the town. Mr. E.F. Reed of Chester, South Carolina was in the city yesterday looking after the interest of his railroad, the Carolina and Northwestern. When questioned concerning the growth and extension of his road, Mr. Reed said, we are doing very well and before long we will be to Tennessee. The Carolina and Northwestern is already in operation to Mortimer, one of the prettiest little mountain towns you ever saw located 21 miles from Lenore and within 15 miles from Linville City. Mortimer sprung up almost in a night and has flourished like the green bay tree. There are more than 100 houses in the place and some of them are as pretty as any a fellow would find in a day's journey. On the 15th of June, a handsome new hotel was opened and is now doing business. I cannot imagine a better location for a little town than the one in, on which Mortimer is built. The force behind the town is the Wilson Creek Lumber Company, owned largely by W.M. Ritter, a West Virginia capitalist. The company owns and operates narrow gauge railroads in and about the village. The company operates the power plant that furnishes the town with electric lights. Lenore News, July 7, 1905. Of course, Ritter Lumber Company's only reason for being here was the timber, and there certainly was lots of it to be cut. 
Actually, state figures, as reported in January 1912, estimated that lumber worth $4 million was shipped out of Western North Carolina in the preceding year. A Ritter lumber spokesman said in 1917, while the company was in the process of leaving Wilson's Creek for a fresh supply of timber, that there were two million to three million board feet of sawed lumber that were to be loaded on the train and removed. Equally, as important as the timber and the band mill, which cut it into lumber, was the railroad. Wood trestles were built where they were needed to link the hills and hollows of Mortimer and Edgemont and the entire area with Lenore, Hickory, and Point South. This 90-foot high trestle in the Attico area, below Brown Mountain Beach, reportedly was the highest such railroad trestle east of the Mississippi. A depot was built in Mortimer in September 1905. As the railroad lines were built, there was a demand for gravel for ballast as well as for rock for other projects. A Hickory newspaper account in 1913 told about the opening of a granite quarry in the gorge and predicted Wilson Creek would soon be the site of a generating plant to harness the power of the river and provide electricity for the area. Today, the remnants of the quarry just off the road are barely visible in the brush and trees. Mr. J.W. Pope, manager of the Wilson Gorge Rock Company of Wilson Creek, was a business visitor to Lenore Saturday. Mr. Pope said his company was rushing the work on their plant and already had most of the machinery installed, and they expect to begin active operations next week. Lenore News, October 7, 1913. Always, there was the threat of flooding after heavy rain. The two major disasters came in 1916 and 1940, but there are frequent references to roads and trestles being washed out by last week's rain and that the fact that the trains haven't been able to run. Mr. H.L. Whitley, with a force of hands, has been on the line for several days doing some repair work since the heavy rains a few days ago. The trains will probably get to Edgemont again this week. Mortimer Notes, February 5, 1906. The heavy rains of last week did much damage to this part of the country, the heaviest damage being sustained by the Ritter Lumber Company, a lot of their tram road being washed away and trestles wrecked. Some damage was done to the CNN Railway. Mortimer Notes, October 24, 1906. Manufacturing is yet suspended at the plant there owing to the recent washout of the tram roads a few days ago. Mortimer Notes, December 7, 1906. Okay, now I'm, I'm coming to you from, I'm not really sure if this might have been Main Street, Mortimer, but the, the road that I'm standing in now certainly was built upon the side of the former railroad tracks as it came right through Mortimer. And today we don't, we don't understand the reliance on the railroad that Mortimer residents felt. But keep in mind that horseback or horse and wagon still was the way people traveled. Their horses were important, and so were the roads, although there was a considerable amount of complaining about the roads. Horses were so important, in fact, that they occasionally got their obituary in the newspaper. Mortimer News from February 1906 recorded that a nice large horse owned by the Wilson Lumber Company died a few days ago. And we won't attempt to verify the veracity of this account of an accident involving a horse owned by Millard Hamby of Edgemont in September 1908. The horse that belongs to Millard Hamby was badly cut Tuesday by barbed wire. Bandages seemed to avail little toward stopping the flow of blood when one of the neighbors said he could stop the flow by simply looking at the wound and repeating a certain verse in the Bible. The bandages were removed, the verse repeated. The blood ceased to flow almost immediately and the wound is healing. The gentleman said his mother taught him that verse and that he has another which will cure the bite of a snake. Edgemont News, September 22, 1908. And as for the condition of the roads, consider this Lenore news item in its Mortimer Notes from August 1905. The public road leading from this place across the mountain to Collinsville is now in very bad condition. Wonder if the overseer did not start across and by some accident slipped into a hole. We suggest that the county road supervisors investigate the matter. Mortimer Notes, October 18, 1905. Or this one from September 1908. 
Mr. C. Clark had a rather serious accident last week. He was on his way from Mortimer with a wagon load of merchandise when by some means his wagon got off the road, turned over in a deep gorge, pulling the team in also. Happily there was no great damage done, losing only two and a half cases of soda water. Lenore News, September 29th, 1908. And this one from Edgemont News in October 1908. The Edgemont citizens complain a good deal about the condition of that part of the road between here and Mortimer, which is included in the corporate limits of the latter city. Edgemont News, October 16, 1908. Much of the original road is gone today, covered by weeds and trees. However, sections of it can still be recognized, such as this one. There have always been boom times and slow times. One slowdown apparently came in 1906 when several newspaper accounts reported. W.M. Ritter Lumber Company has stopped all their logging camps but one and are just running the mill three days in the week. Mortimer News, February 28, 1908. Business in this section as yet remains very quiet. W.M. Ritter Lumber Company is only operating their plant half time and the panic and bad roads are both unpleasant for the lumber hands. Mortimer Notes, March 13, 1908. However, a still developing nation was hungry for lumber and there was money to be made and boom times returned. The Ritter Lumber Company will soon move their southern offices from Virginia to Asheville in order to manage their business better. The Ritter Lumber Company is one of the largest hardwood concerns in the United States, their general offices being in Columbus, Ohio. They have many factories in this section of North Carolina and in Tennessee and South Carolina. Lenore News, July 7, 1908. The W.M. Ritter Lumber Company is running their plant practically full time now and business is picking up. The company has two logging camps running in the woods. Mortimer Notes, September 15, 1908. Okay, now I'm coming to you from almost downtown Mortimer, if you can believe that or not. I'm standing at the foot of actually what was the bridge that the citizens of the town of Mortimer walked across. I would be looking into an area of the town where there were a few houses, but the main town of Mortimer was located directly right here behind me. Ritter's store was over here, and in the store was the post office. And when they incorporated Mortimer, the town limits actually were from the inside of that store in the post office for a one mile radius. So the center of town was just right over here, and from inside that store for a one mile radius were the, the town limits. And the depot was over here, the store, the post office, and all up through here were all the mill houses where most of the people who worked for the lumber company lived. And this was a bustling little community at one time right here. The name of Mortimer came from two brothers, Jim and Bill Mortimer, who worked for Ritter Lumber Company. Jim, the general superintendent, lived elsewhere but made business trips to town. Bill Mortimer and his family lived there. Bill operated the company store and post office in the rear of the store. In 1907, Mortimer became an incorporated town by an act of the General Assembly. The legislation was enacted on February the 6th, 1907, and provided for the village's incorporation as the town of Mortimer. It provided for the election of a mayor and three commissioners on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in May, 1907, and required that they all be bona fide residents of said town, but did not require that they be qualified voters. The legislation provided that W.A. Mortimer would serve as mayor and S.T. Jackson, C.F. Patton, and Lawrence H. Coffey as commissioners until the May 1907 election. The mayor and commissioners were to serve two-year terms. The mayor also was authorized to conduct what was called municipal court. W.A. Garland became the town's first police chief. And Residents of Globe and Wilson Creek Township announced in June 1906 that they would petition the Board of County Commissioners in July to establish a new precinct to be known as Wilson Creek Township, removing part of Globe and Johns River. The township became a voting precinct and soon was discovered by the politicians. Many people are glad to know that the new township of Wilson Creek has been established. Mortimer Notes, August 24th, 1906.
Nearly all the county candidates, including other speakers, have been around to see us at administer chin music freely, but from the best we can learn, fully half of these racers will be defeated. Some of our people attended the Republican rally at Lenore Saturday. Mortimer Notes, November 6, 1906. And almost immediately had an election scandal. The election passed off quietly here last week, and that is about all the good that we can say about it. For some unknown party had the nerve to bring the painful shame on our new township by stuffing the ballot boxes. We are sorry indeed that this occurred, and we hope that we may still have the right to retain our precinct and that efforts will be made to have decent elections held at this place. However, there is a guilty party, and we would be glad to know that they got what they need and deserve. Mortimer Notes, November 20th, 1906. Reports from that time say that Ritter Lumber had as many as 800 employees. Some of them lived with their families in town, others lived in lumber camp, up and down the hollows and streams, accessible only by the railroad. The company had five locomotives, commonly known as sidewinders, which transported logs from the surrounding hills and valleys to the mill in town. Working on a sidewinder could be dangerous at times. Some of the lumber sawed at outlying mills got a ride to town by flume, a water-filled trough. A visitor to Edgemont had this to say about what he saw in August 1908. Two miles south of Edgemont is Mortimer, headquarters of Ritter Lumber Company. Their big plan at this point consumes an amount of timber that is astounding to the average layman. This company has a flume ending at Edgemont which brings the sawed lumbers from sawmills as far back in the mountains as eight miles. Workers received their pay in scrip with which they could trade at the company store. Later, during the bank holidays of the Great Depression, scrip was commonly used to pay workers. The Lenore News Topic recorded in March 1933 that the town's furniture manufacturers had agreed to issue scrip until the crisis had ended and the merchants in Lenore had agreed to accept it for merchandise. Dr. Claude Moore from the Globe community was one of the early company doctors. He and others who served the community through the years would ride the company motor car on the narrow gauge tracks to treat people in the area. Mr. Joel Phillips and wife Selenia both have been quite ill for several days. Mortimer Notes reported in November 1905. Mr. Phillips is one of the oldest men in our neighborhood and it is feared he will not recover. And don't forget that people still died from illnesses we've since conquered with miracle drugs. The Mortimer Notes reported in March 1907, several of our people have had the grip, and some the grip has had them. And our Dr. Coffee has made a good distribution of pills, syrups, and so forth. So we hope that they will all be soon well again. And I'm sure, and I think, I'm not positive, but I think grip is what we commonly refer to as the flu now. A midwife was available to help in childbirth. Traveling dentists provided dental care. Dr. R.D. Jennings from Banders Elk has been in our village for a few days doing some dental work. Mortimer News, December 15, 1905. Dr. Abernathy of Granite Falls is quite busy in the town this week doing dental work. Mortimer News, January 26, 1912. Life was short for many people in those years. Mortimer Cemetery, still maintained today, contains the graves of numerous children. Several of the graves have only a river rock for a headstone. An October the 12th, 1909 story in the Lenore News tells of the death of Lula Ward Braswell, youngest child of Joseph G. and Arabella Braswell. We don't know what took the child's life. Perhaps they didn't know either. But there is a graphic picture of the grief felt by many in the community. The writer said, this sweet little child of the covenant was four years and three months of age and was one of the best, sweetest, and brightest children of her age in the large and flourishing Sunday school of which her devoted father is the superintendent. The teacher, Miss Emma Hutchison, so well known for her devout and consecrated life was the Sabbath school teacher of Little Lula, and through the faithful religious instructions imparted by this godly lady and that of her good parents, the hope that she expressed to her mother during her last illness of a place ready for her in the house of many mansions is very comforting and consoling to all the grieving strict family. For three long weeks, this little child suffered intensely from the fatal malady which caused her death. 
During this period, the Christian and neighborly sympathy shown the anxious family by the people of Mortimer generally was warm, tender, and untiring. But especially were the Christian and kind-hearted ladies of all denominations most attentive in the sacrifices they cheerfully made in helping to nurse and care for little Lula in her distressing sufferings. The large attendance at the funeral service, which was held at the hour when Sunday school met in the Presbyterian Church, of which little Lula was a member and her good father, the superintendent, was solemnly appropriate and touching beyond expression. After the little grave had been filled, the children of the Sunday school covered it with exquisite flowers tastefully arranged. Well, again, I know it's, it's hard to believe, but I'm standing in, in practically downtown Mortimer. Again, from the creek across the way here, the Ritter's General Store was right over here, the post office in there, that actually was the very center of town. And right in this area behind me would have been Ritter Lumber Company's band mill. Now that was the, the sawing place that all the lumber came. Some probably would come down and be transported here by flume. Some would have come in from over here on this side where the railroad train brought it in. But the band mill, of course, was a, a huge log sawing operation, not the traditional saw blade that you would think of, but actually the saw blade was a, a band, and that's where they got the, the name from. But all of that stood right in here behind me, and all the lumber came in this area, and uh, again, being right here in what would have been downtown Mortimer, logging was hard work and it was a risky business. And working at Ritter's band mill brought its own set of hazards. Those who built and maintained the railroad had their own sets of risks. Mr. Dave Govley, one of the employees of the Wilson Creek Lumber Company, working on the log train last Wednesday, accidentally got his leg broken, crushing both bones below the knee. Dr. Ballard placed the limb in position again and he is getting along nicely. Mortimer Notes, November 3rd, 1905. Mr. E.B. McCullen, a lumber inspector, has been confined to his room for a few days by a pile of lumber falling on him. We are glad to say he is better now. Mortimer Notes, November 17, 1905. Mr. W.H. Webb, the popular sawyer at the band mill, had one of his hands badly torn up a few days ago by a split on the log dragging the saw off. He has gone to Pennsylvania for treatment. Mortimer Notes, August 24th. 1906. There are frequent references from these early days about workers being seriously injured in an accident at the lumber mill. Train wrecks didn't happen often, but when they did, they often resulted in injuries or death. Last Friday, a logging train of the W.M. Ritter Lumber Company near Attica ran away and jumped the track and instantly killed one man, Game Corpany, and wounded several others. One of the wounded, Ike Johnston, it is reported, died that night of his injuries. The train started down a steep grade and the workmen lost control of it. All jumped except Corpening, who was crushed to death when the train left the track at a curve, his body being badly mangled. Lenore News, April 30th, 1912. The engine and tender of the southbound CNNW train number nine was derailed a short distance this side of Mortimer Friday morning. No injuries were sustained except engineer Uncle Bob Smyer suffered a mashed hand. Lenore News, February 29, 1918. Two men are at the point of death in a Gastonia hospital with hardly a chance for recovery and several others are suffering from painful injuries as a result of a collision between a motor car belonging to the Ritter Lumber Company and a section motor car of the CNNW Railway. The desperately injured men are F.W. Litz, Vice President of Ritter Lumber, and Gus Branch, one of the section men from Attico. The other injured are H.G. Cobb, Ritter Lumber Company machinist, and J.L. Lowry, CNNW section foreman. The accident happened a few minutes after 7 o'clock in the morning, just as Mr. Lowry was bringing his men to the lower end of this section to begin his day's work. The Ritter Lumber Company car was returning from Lenore where it had come to carry Mr. Litz to Mortimer. The car was supposed to have returned to Mortimer before 6 o'clock or before any section men had got out on their sections. Immediately after the accident, a special train was sent from Lenore carrying physicians and nurses. The injured men were hurried to Gastonia where they were met by surgeons from Charlotte.
practically no hope as hell for the recovery of Mr. Litz and Mr. Branch. Lenore News, July 14, 1916. Officials of the Ritter Lumber Company passed through here Wednesday en route from Gastonia to their plant at Mortimer. They have been at Gastonia with Mr. Litz, vice president of the company, since he was injured a week ago Wednesday. They say Mr. Litz cannot live another few hours. Mr. Branch, the section man from Collisville, has improved considerably but still has no understanding. It seems that Mr. Branch was injured about the base of the brain. Lenore News, July 21, 1916. Train wrecked at Mortimer. Last Saturday evening, as one of the logging trains of the Ritter Lumber Company was coming down a steep grade on one of the company's logging roads, the engineer lost control of the train and it ran away, and five woodmen were right badly injured. One, a man named Bentley, having his jawbone broken in two places, and he sustained other injuries. He was taken by special train to Hickory Sunday and then to Statesville for treatment. The others are being cared for at Mortimer. It is remarkable that a number of persons were not killed, for there were 25 or 30 workmen on the train returning from their week's work in the woods when the wreck occurred, and how they all escaped instant death is almost miraculous. The five carloads of logs were piled on the engine and each other in a way that would seem to make the escape of anyone impossible. The engineer and fireman jumped and saved themselves before the wreck occurred. Lenore News, May 11th, 1909. If you were seriously injured in those days, you faced an uncomfortable train trip to Gastonia, Charlotte, or elsewhere where better medical treatment was available. Education was not forgotten. A school was built there, and a teacher who boarded in the community taught the children. A school term in those days consisted of about three months. An August 1906 notice in the Lenore News informed the readers, there will be a meeting at Mortimer next Friday night in the interest of a good public school for that vicinity. It is needed and everyone interested should be present. Schools frequently were in the news. Mrs. Lucy Laxton began her school here last Monday. Mortimer Notes, September 25th, 1905. Miss Kate Deal, who is teaching school in this district, and Master Cleveland Bowman left this morning for Lenore, where Miss Deal will visit her parents for a few days. She will return next week and take up her duties as teacher. Mortimer News, September 29th, 1908. The same interest continued as Edgemont grew. Okay, now we're coming to you from the home of Ollie Hollander. She's uh, quite a remarkable young lady. She's 91 years old. She was born in the Roseboro community, just above Edgemont, actually in Avery County and taught in the public school systems in Avery County and Caldwell County for a total of 40 years and four months. And quite remarkable about her at the age of 60, returned to Appalachian State to receive her master's degree. She retired from teaching in 1974. So you taught school in Edgemont for about 11 years? That's right. <laughs> and you went there, I believe, uh, about 1937. Mm -hmm. I think it was. Three. So was that a one-room school? Yes, uh, it was. And yeah. were you the only teacher there? Yes. Uh -huh. Did they have, uh, were the school administrators, were there, was there a principal, uh, were there other faculty members, uh, administrative? No, we uh, just were all alone pretty much and uh, of course, I would report to the superintendent of schools in Lenore, and my reports would go in to him, and, and uh, occasionally we'd have visitors come out to the school, and uh, we just had it pretty much to ourselves. And, and those 20 students that you would teach, were they all in the same grade, or were they all in different grades? No, at different times, I think probably we had some in all seven grades maybe one or two in, in each grade. So how were you able to teach well, all I those different levels? Well, I tried to work out schedule to uh, get from one group to another group, put one group to work then and, and go on to another group. And being all in the same room, they learned a great deal from one another, I think. They were familiar with what was coming the next year because they'd been present the year before and knew what, what the previous year had been. 
so uh, I, I, there was advantages, I think, in a one-room school because they did a lot of learning from one another. And uh, back in 1937, and in your early years teaching, was most of the, the travel by school bus? Did the, did the students get to school by bus, or how did they get to school? Uh, when I first started teaching at, uh, at Edgemont, they uh, would bring them, the Mortimer students in, in my car. And then uh, I, I don't think they put on buses till after they started taking them to college for. And, uh, and they used cars at first, I believe, to take them over to Globe and meet the bus there and on to college for. Yeah. Best I remember. So, so in, in 1940, where was the school located? Where. Uh, it was rebuilt on the same same place. The building that's there now is in the same location that the first school was. It had been there for years, a nice school building, but I don't know how many years, as far back as I could ever remember. It but it was a one-room mm -hmm. school? Yes. Well, I'll, let me ask you one little personal question. When you were teaching back in those days, or when you started teaching, what was your salary back then? I think I'm right, seventy dollars a month. I so think it was. You, you earned seventy dollars a month. Yes, on an elementary age certificate, one year college. <laughs> All right. So talk a, a little bit about how you were able to teach after only one year of college. How? how well, you... the, the state issued an elementary age certificate that allowed teachers to teach after they had had one year of college, so that was pretty nice. And we had learned in that one year we had had teacher training at Appalachian, was Appalachian State Teachers uh, College then, and it was strictly teacher teacher training we had, and it was good. We, we got a lot of information and things we needed to know, you know, to begin teaching. So, so you you taught uh, the school year was uh, about six months. I, I faintly remember that at first it was six months. Uh, it must have been for me to get in as much time. I would go back to Appalachian uh, at the beginning of the summer term or the spring term, and. Uh, I think I went back for the spring term and the summer term and, and finished my college uh, work that way. Uh, so and you, so you would teach while school was in session and then mm -hmm. you would return to yes. Appalachian? go back, yes. And, uh, so were you able to complete your degree in four years? Yes, I think I did, yes. Well, let's jump ahead uh, quite a few years. Why did you decide to return to Appalachian for your master's degree? Well, I had age? always, actually, I had my doctorate in mind. That's what I wanted to do. So you, you're probably still I still, going to go back yeah, and do that? I always, I always lived with that thought, but uh, I was determined to go back when they put the MA program on at Appalachian, I just felt sure I was going to go back and uh, and finish that. So I did. Uh, it was an, an extra year, I think, was required to get the MA degree, the best I remember. So I went back between times uh, in teaching along and got that. So before the roads were were improved. There really wasn't a way to continue school. No, no, we uh, couldn't go on, uh, couldn't stay home and go on past the, about seventh grade. Well, under those under those conditions, how were you able, or what what provided you the opportunity to to even go on to high school and and then college after that? Well, my last teacher I had, she encouraged me going on to Mulan and. Uh, and go to high school, and uh, so uh, I did. I would board with different families, and uh, the county con contributed a little bit toward the expenses, I believe, and uh, and I would help in the home some, you know, and uh, and go to school and until uh, I finished high school. So the the, the county 
contributed money to uh, to assist? There was a little bit of light on the can't remember, it was a very small amount the county allowed. I can't remember how or what it was, but it wasn't much, I don't think. It was too so we, I was just real lucky though to live with some good families and the principal of the school up there. I lived with them one year and at the Levin Hotel one year and uh, and, uh, and then Mr. C.L. Hughes had a pretty large store there in New and I lived with them the remainder of my time. I got through school. <laughs> and then you graduated from high school mm -hmm. in Newland. Yes, in 1929. And then how were you able to go on to Appalachian? Got a little loan uh, from the bank, and I think it's from Illinois, and uh, that financed my room and board at the uh, dormitory at Appalachian. And tuition, I think, is about $10 to register, so tuition wasn't anything then up there compared to now. <laughs> <laughs> So I got to the first year, and then I was on my own pretty well so when you, I could then teach. You, then you began teaching yes, after the first yes. year and earning your $70 a month. Yes, I think it increased gradually. And <laughs> well, how, uh, how would you compare the, the students from, from the 1930s and 40s to students at the end of your teaching career? Well, uh, I guess I always uh, felt like that those early students had many advantages that they don't have today even. <laughs> I uh, said when they would come to college for you know, to school, uh, I could see when when our school was consolidated with Collegeville from Edgemont. Uh, of course I went on teaching then at Collegeville and uh, it seemed our, our children fitted in real well in a larger school, and I, I think they they were well prepared, even though it was one room school. I think they they uh, had learned a lot. I, I think there was an advantage there. I really do, and uh, I still do. When they consolidated Edgemont School with Cosford School, then of course they took us by bus uh, directly to the school. I rode the bus, and Margaret Miller, another elementary teacher who lived on up uh, on, on up past us, uh, we rode the bus to college. Okay. When when I was standing just down below where the Mortimer Hotel, I think more commonly known as the Laurel Inn was located, and it was all back up here on the back, up on top of this hill behind me. And probably despite what you would think today, Mortimer did not suffer from a lack of information about other places. There are numerous accounts of people coming from many other states to work or visit. Mortimer may have had a greater blending of different cultures and people from different areas than any other town of its size. Traveling salesmen visited frequently, offering everything from machine parts to items for the homes. Traveling photographers made family portraits. The hotel was a center of entertainment with guests often coming for weekends. Theodore Roosevelt reportedly was among the guests and is said to have danced with Mrs. Bill Mortimer in the hotel ballroom. The hotel frequently was the scene for social gatherings and Mrs. Mortimer apparently was a frequent hostess for these gatherings. Our young people enjoyed a very quiet little sociable at Laurel Inn Thursday evening, Mortimer Notes reported in September 1905. Last Friday night, a very delightful dance was given by the young gentlemen of Mortimer to the young ladies, the reporter reported in January 1906, giving a list of all who attended, complete with the stags and chaperones, and including that everyone reported having had a delightful time. On Saturday night, through the kindness of Mr. and Mrs. W. A. Mortimer, quite a number of young ladies and gentlemen were entertained at a card party. The list of those attending follows. The refreshments were delicious, and everyone enjoyed themselves immensely. Mrs. Mortimer is a charming hostess and made everybody have a good time. All bid them good night and said they never spent a more pleasant evening and hoped it would not be the last time to be invited to their residence on such occasions. Mortimer Notes, January 8, 1906. 
Quite a number of our young ladies and gentlemen were entertained at a Valentine party at the residence of Mr. and Mrs. R.F. Harvey Wednesday evening. All report having had a nice time. Mortimer Notes, February 1906. Quite a number of our young ladies and men were entertained at the home of Mr. and Mrs. W.A. Mortimer last Thursday evening. Parlor games were played and ice cream, cake, and candy were served. All present report a good time. Mortimer Notes, June 1906. Those inclined toward music had their own outlet. Mortimer Notes reported in February 1906 that the musicians of Mortimer have recently added a nice bass violin to their string band and that the Mortimer String Orchestra will give a free concert in Public Square Saturday evening for the benefit of the poor. And what about a moonlit boat ride for a young gentleman with his favorite girl? Quite a number of our young people have been enjoying themselves boating on the pond for a few days. Several nice new boats have been furnished by our young gentlemen. Mortimer Notes, April 5th, 1906. The advent of the excursion trains brought hundreds of visitors to Mortimer and Edgemont, and what probably was Caldwell County's first flirtation with tourism. The new depot built by the CNN people at this place is a very pretty building, as well as convenient, and adds much to the beauty of our town. Mortimer Notes, September 25th, 1905. The CNNW Railway will run a cheap excursion, one fare plus 25, on account of Howe's Great London shows at Lenore on October 13th from Edgemont. Train will arrive in time for a big free street parade, returning after afternoon show. Mortimer News, September 29th. 1908. Probably within the next 60 days, Charlotte people may be able to take an interurban car at Independence Square and speed away for Lenore, Edgemont, and the mountains. This will be made possible by a traffic arrangement by the Carolina and Northwestern Railroad. Charlotte Chronicle, April 16, 1912. An extra coach was attached to train number 10 Saturday, carrying a big excursion party from Maiden to Edgemont to spend Sunday. Mortimer News, July 15th, 1913. We understand the schools of the town are planning an excursion to Mortimer on May 11th. The idea is to combine and have a big picnic up there at that time. Captain P.J. Johnson is said to be at the head of the undertaking. Lenore News, April 27th, 1906. This will be a personally conducted excursion, whatever that is. The train will be run on a safe and slow schedule in order to allow ample opportunities for all to view the grand scenery through the gorge of Wilson's Creek. Lenore News, May 4th, 1906. The jolliest crowd of the season passed through our village last Friday on the excursion from Lenore to Edgemont. They came back in the afternoon and gave our little village a pleasant call. The CNNW people deserve congratulations for putting an extra train running daily to Edgemont. The accommodations on this train for the traveling public are something to be proud of. Mortimer Notes, May 18, 1906. The excursion to Edgemont yesterday was so well patronized that no passengers were taken on north of Maiden. Many people were disappointed. Quite a party went down to the station here just to see the train pass, and they saw it pass at the rate of 40 miles an hour. Some of the party had fishing rods, guns, and other picnic fixings that seemed to be unnecessary luggage just to see a train pass. Mortimer Notes, May 25th, 1906. Mortimer had two churches, one of which was built in 1906. Visiting ministers came to preach and often stayed overnight. Services often were held as many as three times on Saturday and twice on Sunday. Sometimes there would be only one meeting in a month. Reverend C.A. Monroe visited us again and preached to our people at Laurel Inn Sunday at 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. Subscriptions are now being raised by some of our people to build a church in our village, and if the house is built, it will be controlled by the Presbyterian denomination. Everyone is invited to help along a good cause. Mortimer Notes, November 17, 1905. Mr. Will Otter from Lenore came up last week and laid the foundation for a new church and it is hoped it will be completed in a short time. Mortimer Notes, July 1906. Rev. R.T. Annis filled his regular appointment Saturday and Sunday at the Baptist Church, January 18, 
1907. On the night of the same day, the writer held religious services in the well-known lumber town of Mortimer, which is scarcely more than three years old and has a population of about 400 people and nearly all the modern conveniences of our large towns, except sidewalks made of concrete cement. Letter from C.A. Monroe to Lenore News, September 27, 1907. The focal point of life around here was always Wilson's Creek. Ritter Lumber Company and the railroad both had to always keep the presence of the river in mind in the lumber operation. And even though the railroad paralleled the creek most of the time, there were occasions when it had to cross over the creek and over, and over other little tributaries and hollows as it passed through here. The Caldwell and Northern Railway was finished to Edgemont this week. According to the new arrangement, trains will be operated between Edgemont and Gastonia instead of Hickory and Mortimer as now. We do not know the exact movement of trains under the new schedule, but it will be another chance for getting into Charlotte and other points down that way. Lenore News, January 12, 1906. Mr. Baker with a force of hand started building of the new depot at Edgemont last week. The locomotive on CNN now is running to Edgemont every day except Sunday and turns on the Y. Mortimer Notes, January 22nd, 1906. The creek was a place for good times. Frequent swimming parties are mentioned in early newspapers. But it was also a place for tragedy. There are reports of drownings. Uh, an especially heartbreaking incident happened in late July 1909. The newspaper headline said, Two Girls Meet Death in Wilson Creek. The newspaper article went on to say that last Wednesday afternoon, about 4.30 o'clock, a party of girls went bathing in Wilson Creek at Mortimer, and two of the party, Mabel Gertz and Nanny Bailey, were drowned. The six or eight in the party were all young girls and they were all having a fine time when Mabel Gertz, while trying to swim, got strangled and began drifting toward deep water. Nanny Bailey went to her rescue when she too became strangled and they both were carried by the current into water over their depth. Mrs. Bailey and several other ladies were on the bank watching the bathers and they did all they could to rescue one or two other girls who, in their excitement and efforts to render aid, had also gotten into the deep water. The two unfortunate girls were carried downstream by the current and sank before assistance could reach them. The bodies were recovered in 30 or 40 minutes, and every effort was made to resuscitate them, but to no avail. So they were prepared for burial and interred temporarily at Mortimer, but will probably be removed later to their former homes for reinterment. Miss Bailey was the daughter of Mr. W.C. Bailey, who came to Mortimer several years ago from West Virginia and is foreman of the logging force of the Ritter Lumber Company. Miss Gertz was a daughter of Mr. Millard Gertz, who recently came from Pennsylvania and is a saw filer for the Ritter Company. The place where the girls were bathing is a favorite bathing pool and is not considered dangerous, but just below the pool, the water is deep. The following week, A.M. Powell of Lenore described for the newspaper's readers his own experience in helping bury the girls. He says, I was sent by the Bernhard Siegel Hardware and Furniture Company last week with funeral supplies for the burial of the unfortunate girls, Nanny Bailey and Mabel Gertz, who were drowned at Mortimer. And I want to say that I never before saw such deep feeling and sympathy as was there manifested. I, being a stranger, it was difficult for me to tell who the near relatives were. Everybody seemed so stricken and depressed by the awful calamity that it looked as if all were kin. We knew Nanny Bailey, the writer continued, she having gone to school at Davenport with our daughter about her age. She was a sweet girl and much loved by us all. Even today, Wilson Creek continues to claim the lives of people who find themselves trapped down in the gorge and realize only too late just how fast the water can rise when heavy rains fall upstream. Mortimer's first brush with disaster came nine years after the community had been incorporated. In July 1916, a flood swept through the town. Loggers had stripped much of the timber from the hillsides. Heavy rain caused landslides, which created types of earthen dams made of mud and tree limbs and trunks. As the pressure would build up, water would break through the debris that had been blocking it 
and sweep downstream, carrying away homes, businesses, railroad tracks, and sometimes people in its path. Lenore Isolated from Outside World, said the Lenore News headline in July 18, 1916. It reported that the rain began to fall late Friday and continued all during the night and Saturday and Saturday night. This downpour seemed to have reached greater proportions in the Johns River, Wilson's Creek, and Mulberry Creek sections. However, the lack of communication keeps away any definite news. The Carolina and Northwestern, the only railroad into this section, had been put out of business for the time being. At Mortimer, the home of Ritter Lumber Company, practically the whole village was washed away. The houses of 30 employees were carried down Wilson Creek. The lumber plant suffered greatly. The forces of the water caused the brick walls of the powerhouse to fall in, and a part of the planting plant was carried away. The whole population of the town stood on the mountainside and watched the houses one after another as they slipped from their foundations and broke up in a mad rush down the stream. The CNNW Railway has suffered greatly in property loss. Between here and Edgemont, the road has suffered the loss of trestles and bridges. From Collinsville to Mortimer, up through the gorge, the trestles and fields have all been washed out, and in a number of places the track is said to be swinging. At Mortimer, the long trestle and approach to the bridge from the northern side was washed away. One of the steel railroad bridges above Mortimer was washed down into the edge of town. A train is marooned at Edgemont, the end of the line above here, and there is no probability of getting the track rebuilt to get it out for several weeks. Lenore News, July 18, 1916. Four persons were drowned in Collinsville when the flood swept down Johns River. Every building in Collinsville was filled to a depth of several feet, and 12 buildings were washed away. Only two were left intact. In its wake, a trail of soft black loam covered the first floor of every building to a depth of two to five feet. Reverend J.D. Hart, who returned Thursday afternoon, told the first story of the awful destruction at Collinsville and Mortimer, the sad plight of the inhabitants of the two villages. Mrs. A.P. Shoemake and her three-year-old were swept from their bed Saturday night and carried off in the mad waters. The mother, who was sleeping with her husband and child, had time only to grasp her offspring before she was hurled from her bed. The husband heard her cry, Oh Lord, I am gone. That was the last ever seen of the two. Mr. Shoemake clung to the mattress and was carried downstream a mile before he grasped a tree. W.N. Clark's three-year-old child was hurled from his arms as he and his wife were attempting to escape to the mountains. The wife of Tate Moore, an old Negro, was also drowned. Her body was recovered. When the inhabitants fled to the hills Saturday night, they carried nothing except what they had on their backs. At Mortimer, inhabitants are crowded 16 to a cottage where they are fed from the company store. Everywhere is destruction, but the inhabitants, like those at Collinsville, are not complaining. It is feared that pestilence might break out. The conditions at both places are critical. The stench is terrible and aid is imperative. Various newspaper sources, July 1916. The newspaper continued its flood coverage by reporting that Dr. R.F. Wilson, the Ritter Lumber Company veterinary surgeon, walked in for Mortimer Tuesday to attend to some company matters. Dr. Wilson gave the news a report of the losses suffered by the company and railroad at Mortimer. 32 houses, including 27 just below the railroad near the commissary, were carried away. The roundhouse was partly washed away and the supply house and $5,000 worth of supplies was wrecked. Commissary and offices were badly damaged but not washed away. The lower camps on Wilson Creek suffered greatly. All railroad lines washed away or damaged. The church escaped, the moving picture show and schoolhouse were badly damaged. The creek has changed its course and now goes through the middle of town. The long trestle from the railroad bridges up by the mill was washed entirely away. Until early Sunday morning, the creek rose slowly and nobody thought it would get beyond the high water mark. Then the water began to rise very swiftly and within a half hour it had reached a point five feet above the high water record and buildings were floating from their foundations and going down the stream. This change came about so quickly that nothing could be done and the people rushed to the hills to escape being drowned. This was about four o'clock Sunday morning. The water did not reach the houses above the railroad and station and several boxcars were left standing by the water's edge. 
people living in the houses took care of all who had lost their homes and belongings they could accommodate, and the others took refuge in the station, depot, and boxcars. Lenore News, July 21st, 1916. The storm cut off telephone service in the area. A stretch of the Lenore Electric Company's telephone line three and a half miles long between Collettsville and the Globe was washed out. The poles and all were carried away. Lenore News, July 28, 1916. It is difficult for us to realize today how dependent the county was on railroad at the time. A bridge that crossed the Catawba River just north of Hickory had been washed away by the flood, leaving every Caldwell County community that depended on the railroad with no way in or out. Mr. L.T. Nichols, general manager of the CNNW Railroad, said they would have trains running into Lenore by August 8, providing this weather cleared up, and they have no more trouble with high water and slides. Contracts have been let for temporary and permanent bridges across the Catawba River. Lenore News. July 25th, 1916. Even those whose farm animals have survived the flood were limited in where they could go because of the damage to the roads. The roads, said Mr. Holloway, were completely washed and was impossible to get a horse over some places. And it was out of the question, think of getting a buggy or wagon through that section until some new roads were being built. He said a trail was being cut out to get a pack horse through with the mail. Lenore News. July 28, 1916. At a meeting Monday, it was unanimously decided that the county commissioners borrow $50,000 to build roads and bridges. Lenore News, August 4, 1916. The C and NW Railway, which had transported mail to and from Mortimer, was forced to give up the service for a while. Listen to how the mail was delivered. Since the CNNW has been forced to give up the contract for hauling the mail, a contract for three times a week service between Lenore and Attico has been given to Lenore Livery Company. The carrier makes the trip to Collinsville with a rig and from there to Attico the trip is made afoot. All the mail for Edgemont, Mortimer and other points north is left at Attico and the postmasters at Edgemont and Mortimer or the patrons are sending down to carry it back for distribution. Lenore News, July 28, 1916. Ritter Lumber rushed to help get the railroad back in service. The W.M. Ritter Lumber Company is at work with a large crew of men on the tracks from Mortimer to Lenore. They are working with all possible rapidity and should have their trains running between Mortimer and Lenore within a week. Lenore News, July 28, 1916. The news reported on August 18, 1916. The first train in 33 days reached Lenore yesterday. The Catawba River Temporary Bridge, 600 feet long, was completed in 12 days after the first pile was driven. It was not until yesterday that a heavily loaded freight train was allowed to pass over and bring materials and supplies to Granite Falls, Hudson, Lenore, and other points on this side of the river. Lenore ran rampant with joy when the train pulled in yesterday. And then on August the 29th, 1916, the newspaper reported that the first passenger train is scheduled to operate out of Mortimer beginning today. The first work train was able to get to Mortimer Friday. For nearly two weeks, this train has been working along the Wilson Creek Gorge repairing trestles and washouts. It was not until October 6th, however, that the newspaper reported C and NW passenger engine number 207 was again in service after being marooned at Edgemont since July 15th. The engine was run out of Edgemont last Saturday under its own steam. By that time, however, much of the virgin timber in the area had been cut and the mountains were bare, and Ritter Lumber began curtailing its operation. However, there does not seem to have been much resentment over the fact Ritter Lumber was leaving after cutting all the timber, but merely the acceptance that it all was part of life. The Ritter Lumber Company, which has operated a large mill at Mortimer for the past several years, is now engaged in tearing down and preparing its mill for shipment to Fremont, Virginia. In fact, all the work of packing and shipping the machinery has been completed. It seems that all available timber which could be cut and sawed at this mill with a profit has been used up. Consequently, the Ritter people couldn't afford to operate there any longer. 
W.E. Graham of Lenore, who has been mill foreman at Mortimer, said he would be left in charge of a crew of men for about a month and would be engaged in getting the two or three million feet of sawed lumber in shape for shipment. He says that when his crew and he leave Mortimer, there will be nobody left up there and he fails to see how it will pay to run trains up that far without the CNNW has prospects of extending its track onto Tennessee. Lenore News, September 7th, 1917. A few days later, the newspaper reported the railroad office had been closed following the opening of the railroad line to Edgemont. The Ritter Lumber Company has shipped all the lumber from its yard at Mortimer and is now cleaning up the last pieces of machinery left since moving its plant to Fremont, Virginia. Employees who wanted to stay with the company were transferred to other parts of North Carolina or to other states. However, Mortimer re refused to die. A cotton mill was built about a mile below the village in 1920. J.H. Jones became the first superintendent of United Milling Company, and his mother operated the hotel, which was used as a boarding house for company guests and employees. The news on December 13, 1918 reported, one of the biggest projects in view for the Mortimer section is a 10,000 spindle cotton mill, which is reported to be underway. The mill, according to the report, will be located on the Talbert property at the gorge. The mill will be operated by water power developed from Wilson Creek. If this mill is built, it will mean the establishment of a small city at the gorge. The help required for a 10,000 spindle mill and their families will be nearly 1,000 persons. The development of the gorge water power and establishment of a mill there will without doubt be followed by other water power and industrial development along the C and NW Railroad on Wilson Creek. So with the promise of jobs at hand, people started coming back to Mortimer. Men and women were employed at the mill. As it had been in the Ritter era, employees were paid in scrip, which could be traded at the company store. As the 1920s neared, automobiles were rare in Mortimer and Edgemont, and most people came to town by train. Actually, cars were rare practically everywhere in Caldwell County. A February 1916 issue of the News quoted state figures showing Caldwell ranked 74th in the state in ownership of automobiles. There were 52 vehicles, or one for every 80 families. The train and the horse and wagon still were kings. Road access to the area was across Staircase Mountain. By 1928, a decrease in the demand for the coarse yarn produced by the United Milling Company forced it to close. And again, many people had to leave the Mortimer area. And I know today it's hard for us to imagine the feelings of the people in this area at that time after the Ritter Lumber Company had closed and left the area, the United Milling Company had closed and left the area. A Charlotte Observer story in 1938 had an account of interviews with people who had stayed in the area after others had left, and despite all the bad things that had happened, they still had an optimism and a strong work ethic. However, they had no knowledge that the picture was to even be darker in just two years. By that time, much of Ritter's land had been sold. The people left in Mortimer had placed their hopes in the coming of a textile mill, but that had failed. The federal government had bought large tracts to use as the CCC camp and about 600 acres still remained. It contained the mill building and electric generating plant, the water supply, the hotel building, three residents re originally built for company officials and 10 or 12 smaller homes built for employees. Up on Harper Creek, the writer said, there also was property where it had been planned to build a dam to generate power. The power was already available elsewhere. The writer bragged about the water supply, which he said comes from a pure stream flowing from a nearby mountain, where a large tank and natural gravitation give the village a perpetual service, which would be the envy of towns and cities which must use force pumps and pressure systems. According to the writer, Mortimer still had a hundred or more residents who felt the sting of economic stress when that mill closed down and their means of making a living was taken from them. A few of the families who worked in the mill are still there, hoping against hope that something will happen to put the mill back in operation. 
He interviewed Prudence Talbert, who at 81 was the village's oldest residence. For God's sake, mister, he quoted her, try to get something started in the mill so my folks here can get work. We can make yarn or we could operate a knitting mill. These men and women here will work at anything just to get a job. He said other women also expressed their wish for jobs, but was impressed that so few of them actually complained about their lot. Sam Rich, who tended a store in the community, said he believed at least 100 employees would be available for any manufacturing plant. Just start up that mill, he said, and the folks will come pouring out of those coves to get jobs. Then he interviewed Will Talbert, caretaker of the mill building and the water system. He had worked for Ritter Lumber and at the cotton mill. He said he was just waiting for some of you to start up something else in the mill so I can get work for you. Talbert wanted to see a furniture plant started there, saying that lumber was being shipped to Tennessee, Lenore, Hickory, and other places, and that it should be made into furniture right here. White maple growing in the area, he said, made beautiful furniture. Then came the Great Depression of the 1930s. The Civil Conservation Corps arrived in Mortimer in 1933 and began a program of trail and road building. As things turned out, this was one of the few good things to happen in the area for years. 300 men were involved in the CCC work. With us now is Mr. Horace Coffey. We're in the home of Mr. Coffey, who now lives in Gamel, but about 75 years ago, Mr. Coffey was born up in the Roseboro community, which actually is in Avery County, but shortly thereafter moved down into the Edgemont uh, and Mortimer area. So, so I grew up there, and then after high school, and I joined the CCC. Spent six months over at Mount Mitchell. How old were you when you joined the CCC? Uh, I believe we had to be 18 at that time. It was. So I stayed six months there and got out and then re-enlisted three months later and was uh, located to Mortimer in CCC. Stayed there from 1st of uh, January 42, I believe, to till, till 1st of July. In the camp, they closed it down and moved everything out to Camp Croft, South Line, I think is induction center for the Army. Well, what about working at the CCC camp? What were some of the kinds of work you guys did? Well, we redid a lot of the roads, uh, stabilizing them and widening them out, and uh, then we done a lot of forest work. Uh, go through and release and cut down some little trees, releasing pines and planting trees, and recreation work of all kinds. We done quite a bit of that. Most of all, fire. Tried to keep the forest fires down, and we done a pretty good job by it, because I think a lot of times we rush right out there and catch a little fire before you get going, you know. So any time there was a forest fire in that yeah, area, that you was, guys would go fight? Yeah. And we had three three fire towers. Today, of course, it's gone there on detection. We had a fire tower up on Rocky Knob, near Blowing Rock. We had one on Chestnut Mountain. Uh, that's kind of west of Mortimer, Edgemont there. And then we had Table Rock. And, uh, yeah. So now when I was in CC, I stayed some, I manned one of those fire towers. And then later when I went with the U.S. Forest Service in 1946 and worked with them up until I retired. Uh, back then it was, and that CCC is $30 a month. Now, if you was a good employee, you got to rate you up to a assistant work leader. That paid thirty-five dollars a month, and if you perform good in that, well, then you go up to great chip to forty-five dollars a month. Of course, forty. 
dollars went a long ways back in those days. Biggest thing though was improve those roads up there because just had a little narrow one way roads. We widened those roads out, and graveled them, they had a rock crusher in there, crushed stone, and graveled them good, and sloped the banks back, and stabilized them, and seeded them back. My uncle Monroe Coffee, he was uh, he was the first forest ranger to when the for the government started buying up property in the mountains. He was the first uh, district ranger. The former CCC camp remains today as a camping area and U.S. Forest Service workstation. O.P. Lutz purchased the United Milling Company property in 1934 and with plans of opening a hosiery mill in the building. However, a number of problems hit involving the closing of the railroad to Mortimer in mid-1938. The most serious setback, however, came two years later, in August 1940, and again, it involved a flood. Lenore received more than nine inches of rain within a few hours. In 1940 dollars, Caldwell County's damages were estimated at $1 million. Road and highway damages were estimated at $250,000, again in $1940. Wilson's Creek and Johns River flooded, as did the Yadkin River in the Patterson area. Uh, did the flood come, or the worst part of the flood, was it, did it come during the day or yes, night? Yes, in the afternoon. It had rained uh, for several days, I think. and. Uh, the, the uh, Wilson's Creek was getting higher and higher, but we didn't think it'd ever be dangerous. But I think it built back at a, a, the largest bridge on up uh, north of us, up through the mountain, and it built back, and the bridge broke, and then's when it came that all that water came it took the homes out. So were you at home? Were you at home when yes, this happened? Well, we saw it coming. We saw it was coming up to our house coming higher and higher. Some of the neighbors had gathered there, there were about 13 of us. Uh, they had all gathered there thinking we were safe being back by the hill more. So thir 13 people from close, close around, around you came to your our house? Our neighbors, yes, and a traveling man and uh, and, he, and another person and, uh, and my neighbors there close by, some of them, in uh, Archie Coffee's. So we uh, went up the mountain, just back of our house was a high mountain, and we just started uh, back up, up the mountain. Uh, and we were afraid to go back. I don't know why we didn't all just go back down the mountain instead of going on so far, but it's a horrible time. It uh, just seemed like the mountains were coming in and the rocks just bumping and, and making such a booming noise going down, you know, in the, in the water. Then uh, the hotel was closing their summer season and uh, they asked us to come and, and live in the hotel because the county had arranged to have school in the dining room. It had a large dining room. They had arranged to have school the next year over at the hotel in the dining room. Was school still in session at the time of the flood? No, that was... Uh, August 1, it, 13th of August when the flood came. No, it was not, but uh, it worked real well. We lived in the hotel and I was teaching, of course, and it was real convenient for me and bus brought the kids in. So you and, and so all, the other, the, the, all the other families live in the hotel? No, the Tatums, their home was washed down way too, across opposite us, across the road. And uh, I don't know what, I can't remember what the... Okay, now we're standing on the current day bridge, uh, just upstream very slightly from the location of the old bridge that was washed away. And with me now is Dennis Coffey. Dennis is the son-in-law of Ollie Hollander, who we heard from earlier and who gave us a very graphic description of the 1940 flood. Well, Dennis, thanks for stopping and speaking with us today. But from your mother-in-law and from the old, older folks that, who've lived in the community all these years, you've heard time and time again stories about the 1940 flood. Would you please tell us what you've heard from those people? I'll be more than glad to. 
Originally, the water came up very easy, and it's not a destructive water. It was just getting everything wet, you might say. And as my father-in-law told the story, is that Wilson's River went down fast, and, and all of a sudden, there was no Wilson's River. So he walked across the road to see what was wrong, and he saw Wilson's River about a yard wide. And as he was standing there, uh, he felt the ground shake, and he looked up and saw the trees moving, and he knew something was wrong. And about that time, he noticed there was about a 25-foot wall of water uh, coming down the middle of Edgemont and taking everything with it. Here, as we were standing here now, um, this is the place where the water uh, made a natural dam. Uh, a lot of timber was cut back then. There was not a whole lot of timber that would hold the water, and so actually it came in here, and as you see, it got real deep in this area. It's almost like a little gorge here. Yes. And when the pressure built up, this is where it broke and came through, and part of the bridge is still laying there, but when it did come through, it washed everything out of Edgemont area. So, of course, from the description, the, the creek actually was very small, be because all the water was being dammed up, no yes, water was being able to get through? Yes, sir. Right here was the dam that was being made. By, it was a natural dam, and uh, it couldn't take much pressure. But the water just kept getting higher and higher. Then when it broke, you had a 25-foot wall of water coming down through at one time. Well, can you recall some of the uh, descriptions of the flood from that time? Uh, obviously, some houses were washed away. What about automobiles? Uh, I have a stump in my front yard that's, that's very memorable for me. Uh, my father-in-law uh, chained his 38 Ford pickup to that hemlock stump, and it still remains there. Uh, but that saved their, their, their transportation. But Mama uh, gave me an account of uh, them going up behind their house, and she looked back and saw the house break away, and her curtains were blowing in, in the window, the kitchen window. And then all of a sudden, she said, the house disappeared under the water. It, it's an eerie feeling to know that all you had was your family, which was the best thing, and the cow that they cut loose. So they... Okay, Dennis, I think uh, from accounts that we've already heard, electricity didn't come into this area until sometime after that 1940 flood. But even had electricity been in the area with the uh, amount of damage that was done, there would have been no communications. Did they, did they talk to you any, or did you hear any stories about how they were able to communicate with each other back then? Yes. Uh, at that time, there were families separated on each side of the river. And the river, the water was still up, and the river was very wide at that time. And you could actually couldn't hear each other hollering. So what they did, they came up, they had a, a milk jug, a metal milk jug, and they would write messages and throw that thing across the river. And, and they would read it and then they'd throw it back. And this went on for a couple of days just to see if anyone got killed or if they were missing anybody. Was the American Red Cross in business at that time? Were, were there any disaster agencies as we know them today able to come and help the people? Very much. Uh, the American Red Cross came in and gave them canned foods and more or less like K rations or C rations from the Army. But they set up uh, mattress making seminars, I guess you might want to call it. They furnished the cotton and the twill and actually showed them how to make mattresses because everybody lost everything up here. Yeah. And so they gave them metal beds and showed them how to make mattresses. Along Wilson Creek, the flood destroyed the former cotton mill, now owned by Lutz, and ruined the new machinery he had installed. However, since the factory had not opened, People had not moved back into the area. Only the mill's foundation and a portion of its boiler room remain today. Remember back to the, uh, as far as the cotton mill days, but I do remember O.P. Lutz having the machinery in there and the 40 flood uh, got up and wrecked the, uh, the water, got in the building, wrecked up all the machines, sand and all of, you know, the machinery and they, taking it all out then and moved to, moved everything out then. Well, well, once I found old cotton mill help it cleaned up, I, 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 they paid me a... Fifteen, uh, fifteen cents, you fifteen cents, me ten. She moved ten cents there and I worked fifteen. Did you, you work? Clean it up, you know, I worked for O.P. Lewis up there when he's cleaning up the old cotton mill just after 1940. He started a full fashion machine up there and then he just got it started good and uh, come out flooded. Few buildings in Mortimer survived the 1940 flood. However, the CCC camp was flooded but not destroyed. 
The 180 men at the camp at that time worked to restore telephone and electric lines and repair roads. In August 1940, issue of the Lenore News Topic said that reports from sections in Upper Caldwell County indicate a heavy toll of destruction of homes, roads, and crops in the heavily flooded area from last Wednesday. The Edgemont community suffered a heavy property loss with 13 buildings being washed away. Five homes, the school, and seven buildings of the Rainbow Camp were carried away. About 50 girls were at the camp, but no one was injured. The high waters failed to reach the hotel at Edgemont, but shifted the dance hall around on its foundation. All bridges in the area were washed away. Food and mail were brought to those stranded at Edgemont by plane Thursday and Friday, and daily trips will be made until the roads are opened. At Mortimer, where the CCC camp and Forest Service headquarters are located, the headquarters building and armory were washed away. The Lutz hosiery mill was badly damaged by water, while nine automobiles were washed away. The water rose 13 feet last Tuesday in a 10-minute interval due to bursting dams and drifts. About 180 boys are stationed at the Mortimer CCC camp and are at work repairing roads and telephones and electric lines in the area as swiftly as possible. Brown Mountain Beach was almost completely wiped out with no beach being left after the storm. Reports on the Edgemont, Mortimer, and Brown Mountain sections were brought in by Hal Hartley, warden in the Daniel Boone Game Refuge, who walked to Collettesville from Edgemont with a party of 14 Boy Scouts from Kannapolis attending camp at Mortimer. Lenore News Topic, August 1940. The railroad, which for so long had been Mortimer's link to the rest of Caldwell County, was removed by the 1940s. The track itself was torn up and used, probably as we've understood, as part of the war effort for World War II. And the remaining bed where the tracks were is used now for the graveled roads in the community. The CCC camp closed by the end of 1942. But still today, from the hundreds of people who worked up here, those survivors still gather up here for an annual reunion. Two miles upstream from Mortimer is the community of Edgemont. Edgemont never became the industrial center that Mortimer did, but rather became well known as a recreational area, very popular for hunting, camping, and fishing, and its hotel. The people of the CNNW Railroad are having a nice two-story hotel erected at Edgemont and when completed it will be a nice and commodious building and will have modern conveniences. Mortimer Notes, March 15, 1907. A government forest road is under construction along the road of the Old Watauga Turnpike between Edgemont and the Yonalasi Road. Monroe Coffee, forester in charge of the Edgemont area, has a bridge crew building a bridge across Wilson Creek one mile above Edgemont and two other crews are working at other places. The Old Watauga Turnpike Company was owned by the Carolina and Northwestern Railway. Fifteen years ago, when it was first opened, a stage line was operated over it between Edgemont and Linville. At that time, it was considered an important route connecting Edgemont, the end of the CNNW, with the counties across the Blue Ridge. Edgemont at that time was a hustling summer resort town. The big plant of the Ritter Lumber Company at Mortimer added considerable activity to the commercial life of the community. In 1916, the Watauga Turnpike was washed away and so was much of the village of Edgemont. The railroad suffered heavily from flood damages and Edgemont as a resort section for the few years that followed died completely. The Ritter Lumber Company finished working its boundary and moved out. Since then, the government has bought practically all of the land in the surrounding section for national forest purposes. Two seasons ago, the Edgemont Inn reopened for summer visitors and since that time there has been an increasing number of persons there. The reopening of the old Watauga Turnpike along with the new road across from Globe to Edgemont brings about a brighter future for the community. The Woodrow Wilson Park Summer Residential District is now being planned by N.T. Webb is the latest development for that section. This park or development consists of 400 acres of land lying along Wilson's Creek and extended back toward the top of Yancey's Ridge. Lenore News Topic, August 20th, 1925. When the railroad first came to Wilson's Creek area, it stopped in Mortimer, but by 1905 it had been extended to Edgemont. Soon after that, the Carolina Northwestern Railroad built the Edgemont Hotel, and then the area was really on its way to becoming a recreational area. 
Now where I'm standing now was part of the original Grandfather Park Estates. And the Edgemont Company and the Grandfather Park Estates are two of the land development companies that were started that did not achieve what their organizers had hoped. It's interesting though that the Grandfather Park Estates deed restrictions from 1925 were unusually rigid, especially for that day. They established setback requirements from property lines, prohibited any billboard or sign larger than three feet, required indoor plumbing, and banned outdoor toilets. The, the Lumber for the Mountain Home Club building is here ready to be taken up the mountain as soon as a little more blasting is done on the road. Edgemont News, October 16th, 1908. Dr. W.T. Shipp of Mortimer is making good progress with his new resort development near Mortimer. He has a wonderfully fine location two miles from the village and has the first unit of his development, a 26-room house, well along. He expects to have it ready for the coming summer season and it is planned to follow this building with other cottages. The place will be modernly equipped and will include electric and massage baths for persons who desire such. Lenore News Topic, February 5th, 1925. Edgemont, the present terminus of the People's Own Railroad, is rapidly taking on the dignity of a live and respectable mountain village. The nice little depot and handsome new hotel erected and elegantly furnished a few months ago are the chief adornment of the place in the way of buildings. The air is bracing, the water is cool and refreshing. To those who desire a quiet, shady, comfortable retreat in summer or winter, fall or spring, this three-story building with a swiftly flowing stream in front of it and hot and cold water and other modern conveniences all through it is very attractive. The proprietors have been fortunate in securing Mr. and Mrs. E.T. Gregg as managers of this mountain motel. They had as many as 365 guests during the summer. On fourth Sabbath at 3.30 p.m., your correspondent had the pleasure of preaching to a select and gospel-hungry congregation assembled in the office of the hotel. Lenore News, September 27th. 1907. The Edgemont residents saw a need for a church of their own and a charter for a Baptist church was signed October 24, 1915. The Reverend B.W. Sims of Lenore Baptist Church was the sponsor and W.C. Moore, known as Uncle Billy Moore, was the first to sign the charter. Moore donated property for the church. The church is still there today. The church was a very important part of the life of the people who lived in Mortimer and Edgemont. And newspaper articles of the time had many articles regarding visiting ministers coming and going. Reverend W.H. Stewart gave us a farewell address Sunday. He will spend some time in the interest of the schools, then he expects to go on a mission to China. Mr. Stewart is a promising young man and we wish him much success in his biblical career. Mortimer Notes, September 15, 1905. The news is informed that a meeting of the prominent Baptist of Edgemont was held Tuesday for the purpose of devising ways and means for the building of a church of that place. A building committee was made and the contract for the building was let to Mr. Bernard Crisp. The church is to be completed within three months. Lenore News, September 12, 1913. During the 1930s, the Wilson Creek area was filled with activity. Although United Milling Company had closed, O.P. Lutz was opening the new textile mill. There were 300 mill in the Civilian Conservation Corps at Mortimer and were building roads and trails throughout the mountains. The Edgemont Hotel still thrived. Life was good. On the 4th of July, the CNNW Railroad would operate charter trains from Chester, South Carolina up to Edgemont. Rainbow Camp up Rock House Creek attracted about 50 girls for summer camp. One of Edgemont's best known individuals came along about that time. Archie Coffey assumed the management of Coffey's store from his brother. The store had no electricity for years. It had a wooden ice box, and it's reported that after ice was delivered on Friday, one could buy a cold soft drink there until Monday or whenever the ice had melted. Prices reportedly were 50 cents for a 25 pound sack of cornmeal, 20 cents for a pound of coffee and five cents for a pound of sugar. Coffee stores sold dry goods, hardware, and eventually gasoline and antiques. It also was the community post office until 1979. Just as the arrival of the railroad had helped usher in boom times, 
Its departure in 1939, along with the flood of 1940, helped hasten the decline that followed. When the railroad left, the tourist traffic stopped, helping kill the hotel. Thus ended the glory days of Edgemont. Then came the flood of August 1940. Days of heavy rain had washed treetops and brushed downstream and wedged them against the pilings of a bridge about a mile north of Coffee Store. The debris under the bridge formed a lake upstream. When the bridge came down, it was though a dam had broken above Edgemont and Mortimer. The flood washed Coffee Store off its foundation and about 35 feet. However, the building was not destroyed. After the water receded, the store was placed back on its foundation. Three low water bridges between Mortimer and Edgemont were destroyed. 51 children reportedly were stranded at Rainbow Camp on Rockhouse Creek. Records from the day indicated that the water crested at 94 feet downstream in the gorge. The water receded, but the damage had been done. This time there was no Ritter Lumber Company anxious to get back to cutting timber off the ridges and no railroad anxious to restore its service. The task of rebuilding roads and bridges was largely undertaken by the men of the Civilian Conservation Corps. The area increased in popularity with hikers, backpackers, trail bike riders, and fishermen in the 1950s and 60s. Coffee store was the only source of gasoline, ammunition, food, and coffee for miles. It was not uncommon for 200 vehicles to pass through the checking station on opening day. The opening day of deer season was the most profitable day of the year for Coffee Store. The check-in station still remains right across the road from Coffee Store, located just right over here to my left. Archie Coffee died January 25th, 1986. His widow, Betty Overcash, now operates the store on weekends. Long after Ritter Lumber Company cut its last tree, and long after the cotton mill washed away, and even long after the last land speculator lost his money off his big land deals, and even after the last plans to dam up the river to form electric power, about the only last remaining thing that's really going on in this area has been this lasting effect and impact of the National Forest Service. It started out rather insignificantly with just some occasional mention of what was going on in Congress and an occasional passage of a bill. But today, 75% of the property that's now in the Wilson's Creek Township is in National Forest Service area. A good deal of interest is being aroused in this part of the country in regard to the Appalachian Park or Forest Reserve. Lenore News, September 20th. 1907. The National Forest Reservation Commission has approved the purchase of 59 tracts, several of which are in Caldwell County. The acquisition of lands was begun in 1911 under the Weeks Law, which permitted the government to purchase for national forest purposes lands on the headwaters of navigable streams in the White Mountain and Appalachian regions. Lenore News, August 28, 1916. Several tracts of land belonging to J.M. Bernhardt, several others belonging to Globe Lumber Company, and one tract belonging to Major Harper, all on the headwaters of the Johns River, have been approved for purchase by the government. One M.M. Hollander tract on the Greg Prong of Lost Cove Creek has also been approved. Lenore News, September 1st, 1916. Some newcomers moved to Edgemont, the more moved away. In 1973, there were 16 families living here. And even as late as 1988, there were still only 16 families living here. But as we mentioned earlier, only nine families live here permanently. But now there are lots of summer homes and cabins in the area now, so there are a lot of part-time families who do come and spend time here. We've heard about W.M. Ritter Lumber Company and its work along Wilson Creek. We've heard about Bill and Jim Mortimer, who gave the lumber town established by Ritter Lumber Company its name. But little's been said about W.M. Ritter, just who was he? His, his full name was William McClellan Ritter. Ritter, a pioneer Appalachian hardwood executive, was born February 19, 1864, in Lycoming County, Pennsylvania. He went to Bluefield, West Virginia in 1890 with $1,700 and began his lumber career. In 1901, Ritter incorporated his business as the W.M. Ritter Lumber Company. And through the years, he bought out several other large lumber companies. 
Ritter Lumber's first office was in Welch, West Virginia, but after several moves, the main offices ended up in Columbus, Ohio. We don't know how many trips Ritter made to Mortimer during those early years of the 20th century. However, the Mortimer Notes column in the Lenore News reported on March 15, 1907, that Mr. W. M. Ritter, president of Ritter Lumber Company from Columbus, Ohio, was here last week on business. Ritter's operation traditionally had focused on hardwood timber, but he realized in the 1920s that the supply soon would be depleted. He expanded his business interests into the Appalachian coal fields, buying a number of coal and coke companies. His coal operations were successful, and by the early 1950s, his production averaged 5 million tons a year. Ritter died May 21, 1952, and when he died at the age of 88, he was worth almost $3.7 million. His coal interests were sold in 1957, and on October 1, 1960, W.M. Ritter Lumber Company, once known as the world's largest producer of hardwood lumber, was taken over by Georgia Pacific Corporation. In 1907, while Mortimer was still booming, Ritter found himself with legal problems in West Virginia. His company was accused of being involved in peonage, a polite word for slavery. Peonage was defined by the West Virginia courts as the status or condition of compulsory service based on the indebtedness of the peon to the master. An investigation had shown that Ritter Lumber Company had imported workers to build a large lumber yard in Wyoming County. Those workers arrived on December 1, 1906. And they were a mix of nationalities and races but were known only by numbers, not by their names. The investigation determined that one of the workers had tried to escape. He was captured, beaten, and returned to the camp by a railroad detective. The investigator concluded the company had forcibly detained and compelled the man to work until they repaid the cost of their transportation. The case against Ritter Lumber went to trial on July 12, 1907. The company earlier had entered a plea of guilty in return for the state dropping the indictments against its employees. W. M. Ritter was called as a defense witness. He praised his superintendents and managers and denied allegations of mistreatment of laborers. He said the company pleaded guilty to peonage in an effort to protect its employees who had been indicted. Ritter said the company had between 1,200 and 1,400 employees in West Virginia and one plant could process more than 18 million board feet of lumber per year. The judge appears sympathetic and almost apologetic for Ritter Lumber in handing down his decision. He said the guilty parties ought to be punished, however, and I quote, to err is human, and many times offenses are committed not through improper motives, not with malice and evil hearts, but through mistaken ideas and concepts of their rights and of what the law is. He reduced Ritter Lumber's indictments from 20 to 10 because several seemed duplications. He also excused the seriousness of the crime, noting that probably not one person in 10,000 was aware of the peonage statute which had been passed in 1867. The judge actually criticized those who had been held in peonage, saying that he did not, from a moral standpoint, stand in the strongest light. The judge ordered Ritter Lumber to pay the minimum penalty under the law, $1,000 per conviction, or a total fine of $10,000. Vast acres of hardwoods had grown in the Appalachians, but in early years there was no great demand for such lumber and no easy way to remove the cut timber from the mountains. The great Appalachian lumber boom exploded in 1890, and by the end of the decade, buyers from outside the region were all over the mountains hunting the choicest timber for outside lumber companies. At one time, Ritter Lumber Company owned more than 200,000 acres of timberland in western North Carolina alone. Other companies had similar holdings. Much of the timber was bought on the stump. A buyer would offer a mountain farmer 50 cents a foot from across the stump. Thus, a tree with a two-foot stump would net the farmer one dollar. Many farmers sold their timber for a small amount of cash and then hired on at the company to help cut their own timber. Mortimer was not unique in that time. There were timber camps and timber towns throughout the Appalachian region and railroads were built to extract the timber. The timber boom peaked in 1910. By that time, great areas had been cut over and production would decline. The companies, such as Ritter, would move on, leaving huge cut over areas where forests were scarred. And there was the risk of forest fires, massive stream pollution, and the potential for floods.
A newspaper reporter once called Edgemont the land that used to be. That may be an appropriate description of this entire Wilson's Creek area. There is no more Ritter Lumber Company. The band mill is gone. A new crop of trees now fills the land. Laurel Inn is gone, a victim of neglect, age, and the weather. Only a pile of rotting wood remains. Edgemont Hotel is gone, a victim of age, neglect, and fire. Only this weeded area remains. Only the concrete foundation of the cotton mill remains. And only the tree and weed-filled concrete reservoir that once provided water from a hilltop. The railroad is long gone. Automobiles now travel up and down the road on the path that trains once traveled. Trees and weeds have gradually overgrown most of the signs of Mortimer. Only the concrete piers of bridges and trestles remain. The concrete base is all that remains of the footbridge that once crossed the creek in downtown Mortimer. Today, about 100 years after this story began, Caldwell County officials hope they can keep the land that used to be as it has been for their children and their children's children. County Commission Chairman Dr. John W. Thuss, Jr. had this to say. Process. It's nice as county commissioners to be able to do something that is going to positively last for many, many lifetimes that our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren will be able to drive up that road and look at the trees and the, the river will be there and it'll be just as clean and nice as it is today. It's really nice to be in a position to do that because a lot of times we do a lot of things, not by choice, that we don't like to do, like build jails and landfills and those kinds of things. They're sort of monuments to the man's other side. So this has been a lot of fun. It's one of those fun things to do. Now, fine, getting to this point. Well, for those of us that are, for country boys, enjoy the woods, for Boy Scouts and what, this is just, this is just absolutely wonderful to be able to do something like this to preserve for future generations the beauty and heritage of this area up here. This is a, I mean, this is a rich historical heritage up here that once we get a welcome center built here, we'll have a, a history component there that people can learn about Edgemont and Mortimer and the things that happened here. They can hear about the flood. Uh, it's just going to be a tremendous project for this county and a great asset for the citizens.